epistemology can be conceptualized as the reflexive focus on ways of knowing the ontological realms of the research process. Feminism itself can be considered to be an oppositional epistemology to counter the existing voids, androcentrisms, male standards, prejudices, and sexisms in existing knowledges. Feminists have critiqued dominant and varied mod modernist epistemologies such as empiricism, biological determinism, rationalism, and culturalism because of their negative understandings of women and gender. In order to do so, of course, they have had to use other epistemologies such as feminist Marxisms, feminist post-colonialisms, feminist post-structuralisms, and feminist psychoanalysis. It is therefore possible to observe and compose a dynamic interplay of critiques and counter-critiques within feminist epistemologies. For instance, Mary John has argued that a number of Indian feminists in particular have taken oppositional standpoints to the normative of Western on the basis of divergent cultural differences. The worldviews of positivism that valorize empirical epistemologies related to neutrality objectivity, scientific observations, testing, and experimentation have been exposed by feminists like Donna Haraway as being ultimately reliant on subjectivity, on the subjectivity of the knowledge producer. Thus, Linda Tuhiwai Smith, for example, exposes the inherent imperialist values that color positivist research among New Zealand, uh, New Zealand indigenous groups. Similarly, epistemologies of postcolonialism, Marxism, and psychoanalysis have shown the assumptions, omissions, and justifications in prevailing knowledges. Moreover, post-structuralist insights into language have few further undermined the fixity, homogeneity, and totality of knowledges and discourses and exhibited them to be partial, fragmented, contingent, and politically informed. Thus, the authority and validity of positivist accounts vis-a-vis -vis the knowledge they produce about women have been severely damaged. Yet, it must also be remembered that feminists have used empiricism to combat the bigoted and repressive ideas about women that emanate from cultural traditions, particularly in the South Asian context. Uja Narayan, for example, has argued that European Enlightenment's traditions of liberalism, rationalism, and positivism are needed to oppose the negative values prevalent in Indian culture that degrade and stereotype women. This is because culturalist rationales from ethnic, religious, and historical traditions, which may seemingly proved to be positive to women, such as the valorization of motherhood, have been utilized to oppress women at the end of the day. Furthermore, rationalism and ontological arguments of gender equity and equality, justice and neutrality have been readily accepted in legal domains of many countries. Thus, it is apparent that these divergent epistemologies have been exploited for the political objective of feminisms at different times in different countries. Consequently, they should not necessarily be constructed as irreconcilable binaries or even as contrarieties. Rather, they should be allowed to coexist, as argued by Foucault vis-à-vis -vis an episteme and understood as pragmatic and strategic methods of researching. Feminists have also proposed alternative epistemologies to fill knowledge gaps and to femi feminize processes of knowledge production. Filling knowledge gaps includes identifying, naming, constructing, and giving value to issues with particular significance for women's bodies and sexualities that had hitherto been ignored in knowledge. 
um, such as female feticide, dowry, transgender identities, sati, marital rape, clitoridectomies, um, anorexia, sexual trafficking of women, etc. The assumptions of homogeneity and universality in Western feminist theorizations have been seriously undermined by epistemologies of differences. These have developed understandings of the diversity and multiplicity of subjectivity, identity politics, and personal experiences of women. In particular, standpoint theories um, <clears throat> are proposed to account for the different categories of women's subjectivities and identities that have led to theorizations about different realities, as I discussed earlier. Standpoint is also argued as being able to reflect the perspectives of the oppressed and is thus valorized for its authority and authenticity as subjugated knowledges, first used by Foucault. Yet this epistemic privilege of subjugated knowledges has also been discredited, not because of the dilemma of dealing with multiple locations and positionalities, but also because it can provide only limited knowledge, as pointed out by Usha Narayan, for instance. So, as Donna Haraway argues, knowledge is not only partial, it is also not innocent given its assumptions and intentions. Standpoint theory has also been critiqued for using such knowledges as a normative standard and for presuming the fixity of experience. At the same time, the implied relativism, pluralism, and homogeneity of standpoint, as well as its emphasis on the conscious subjectivity of the researcher, have also come under attack. Donna Haraway has famously argued relativism is a way of being nowhere while claiming to be everywhere, equally. Here, of course, Stanley and Weiser's counter-argument about not evaluating standpoints in terms of authenticity or relativism, but rather as situated, specific, and local to the researcher is of some value. Key critiques of overarching epistemologies are based on allegations of essentialism. Essentialism can be defined as the attribution and highlighting of certain properties and elements to define something, even if it does not necessarily possess all these properties and elements. Oluwelwe has asserted that many generations of Western writers have stereotyped African women as timid, passive, and family-oriented they are my homogenizing them into victims, particularly in contrast to the dynamism of Western women who fight against male chauvinism in their societies. Furthermore, separatist dichotomies indicative of Western philosophical thinking are frequently constructed between the qualitative and the quantitative, what you were talking about, Barbara, women and men, emotion and reason, nature and culture. And often, these bipolarities are given gender-stereotyped characteristics and values. Essentialism also takes place not only through reductionism and stereotyping, but also through compartmentalization and universalization, as well as through notions and constructions of fixity, homogeneity, and dualisms. I myself have argued that Essentialism also involves prioritizations and attributions of difference without taking into account certain commonalities. For many feminists, these postmodernist insights relating to essentialism pose a critical problem since essentialisms tend to dilute the political intent of feminisms. This is because critiques based on postmodernism often end up critiquing the assumptions of feminist goals and objectives. However, there are many critical positions on essentialism, including that of strategic essentialism, uh, 
as is perhaps best asserted by Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, and I quote here, it is not possible within this course to escape essentializing somewhere. The moment of essentialism or essentialization is irreducible. In deconstructive critical practice, you have to be aware that you are going to essentialize anyway. So then strategically, you look at essentialism not as descriptions of the way things are, but as something that one must adopt to produce a critique of anything. Unquote. Okay, let me leave behind feminist epistemologies and move on to another category or aspect of feminist research methodology, and that of feminist research methods. Um, research methods refer to the ways and means of collecting and constructing data, the analysis, structuring and writing up of data, and are reliant on the researcher's subjectivity, ontology, epistemology, theory, and ethics and politics. A bulk of feminist research methodology has been on the formulation or adaptation of research methods arising from the realization that conventional research methods were not adequate to investigate or construct women's realities. Feminists have intervened into various research methods, approaches, including surveys and interviews and observations and participatory methods, action research, deconstruction, oral history, needs assessments, gender audits, etc., etc., etc. In fact, during the next two days, I think we'll be specifically exploring uh, feminist uh, critical data analysis, um, discourse analysis, theoretical discourse analysis, critical frame analysis, and grounded theory, and so on and so, as well as methods of uh, triangulation, I believe. Um, early feminist methodologies were particularly preoccupied with the question as to whether there was a particular feminist method. For instance, based on women's experiences or in locating the researcher in the same plane as a subject or in doing research for women as discussed by Harding. However, methodological attempts at unification or a prescribed feminist method was soon abandoned in the face of the differences in feminist thinking on research approaches. Of course, feminists were very much involved in critical appraisals of existing research methods, and this led to an initial valorization and appropriation of qual uh, qualitative methods as being more appropriate for reflecting or composing women's experiences rather than the presumed objectivity of quantitative methods. This polarization led to what was perceived as a clash in paradigms as argued by Anne Oakley, for instance. But later work has acknowledged that quantitative methods, despite or as a result of representing and composing experiences through generalizations and predefined categories have had an impact more on policy and political action. While quantitative methods were seen to embody the divergent experiences of, uh, sorry, while qualitative methods were seen to embody the divergent experiences of individual women, they were also problematized for their dependence on constructivism, on interpretivism, and inductivism in particular. Consequently, the clash in paradigms have given way <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Consequently, the clash in paradigms have given way to an appreciation of the specific uses of both quantitative and qualitative methods. <coughs> Furthermore, triangulation arising from mixing of data, methods, theories, and investigators is used not only as a method of validation, but also as a method of portraying and constructing a greater scope, span, shade, depth, dimension, and finer distinction in the knowledges produced. <coughs> Excuse me. 
feminist methodologies have con uh, methodologists have consistently provided additional insights into qualitative and quantitative methods from feminist perspectives. For instance, Delphi uh, has argued that stratifying women according to social positions or class becomes highly problematic due to intervening factors or intervening factors that change such as employment, occupation, marriage and parental backgrounds. On the other hand, the dynamics of focus group discussions and inter interactions have been examined by Wilkinson for their consciousness raising and potential for action as well as the inclusion of underrepresented groups. I myself have argued that literature reviewing is an important research method as it not only contextualizes and legitimizes previous knowledge on the topic, but also represents and constructs the epistemic evolution of the research subject and therefore should be undertaken not necessarily as a critique but as a means of generating knowledge. The assumptions about data collection have also been critically exposed, resulting in experimentation in qualitative methods. Nearly four decades after Bosarap highlighted the economic roles of women in developing countries, feminists are still critiquing a number of global counting systems for discounting the contributions of women to household economies. There is need for alternative models that are elastic and indeterminate, which can account for the shifting contributions of women and the varying priorities and impacts of change. For feminists, research have not been confined to one particular discipline. Consequently, not only is feminist research multidisciplinary in terms of disciplinary sources and perspectives, but it is also interdisciplinary in that it uses trans and cross-disciplinary theories and methods that are new, so that new dynamic and <clears throat> new dynamic fields of study are created over time, such as violence against women, or the girl child, or women in conflict studies. These fields of study sometimes transcend disciplines in terms of the data and information taken into account. Brabra, I think you gave us a very good example of that, talking about yourself. Yet the problems of posting, uh, of post-disciplinary work include the need for varying expertise on the part of the researcher and the lack of a specific disciplinary focus that can lead to unmanageable research. However, writers like Haraway have rationalized that knowledge will always, always be partial. And the usage of reflexivity as a method of analysis and writing up, articulating the positioning of the researcher and internal workings of research methodology has proven to be useful in overcoming some of these drawbacks. Furthermore, it has been argued that reflexivity alongside standpoint epistemology could provide greater objectivity, as argued by Haraway, to research by engaging with the issues concerned instead of ignoring or denying them. When it comes to data analysis, inductive methods have been useful for empirical work, especially as a means of eliciting theory from women research participants. This is seen as an alternative to overarching foundational theorizations that often guide data generation. In particular, grounded theory has been heralded by scholars like Patty Lather as an analytical method that can avoid theoretical over-determinism and researcher-enforced definitions, given that research can be undertaken without any theoretical assumptions or extensive background reading. However, it has also been argued that given the political objectives of feminisms, feminist researchers can never be completely inductive or theory free. As argued earlier, feminist research is situated in feminist theoretical perspectives, objectives, assumptions, ethics, and politics. This is why scholars like De Groot and Maynard 
talk of a middle order approach that is derived from refining concepts in existing theoretical frameworks and the generation of new ideas from the analysis of new empirical situations. This approach combines inductivism with deductivism in data analysis as a means of engaging with the political and theoretical assumptions as well as the field data of feminist empirical research. Let's now take a look at feminist theorizations next. Um, feminist theory is understood and constructed here as an identified system of conceptual rules, structures, assumptions, reasonings, and rationales as to how the subject of research, in this instance women, and gender is understood. Feminists have adapt, adopted, adapted, expanded, and experimented with many theories from politics to development, from literary criticism to anthropology, from sociology to law. From the problem that has no name as identified by Frieden, theorizations of feminism per se have served, centered on different theoretical interests at different times in different places. <clears throat> Understandings of women as victims of oppression and requiring equality with men were influential in the West, especially in the 1960s and 70s. Gross has discussed not only theories of equality, but also theories of difference as addressing women's oppression. Equality has come under fire for its assumptions about measurements, of identicalness and antithesis in making women the same as men without accounting for sexual differences between men and women or the differences of identity politics. As noted earlier, difference has also been problematic due to essentialism and theorists have been grappling with notions of fixity, intra-group hierarchies and intersections and overlaps within differences. Patriarchy has been a crucial feminist conceptualization worldwide, though of lesser import in the West in recent times. Patriarchy has had the capacity to represent the oppressive and exploitative system of men's dominance in societies in totalist terms. It has been seen as an ideology, as a socio-cultural and material structure, and the cause as well as effect of women's oppression. However, patriarchy has been criticized for this ahistorical and static features, as well as the reliance on structure and monocausality. Contemporary research in countries like India and Sri Lanka con conceptualize patriarchy as varying according to different contexts, such as in matrilineal Muslim communities in India. Agarwal for instance, gives an introduction to the interplace of the modernizing institution of the state, community, and household in patriarchy based on the experiences of South Asian and Southeast Asian countries. Candioti has portrayed patriarchy as an interactive relationship between women and men in sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, and East Asia, where women adopt strategies of negotiation and bargaining as well as active and passive forms of resistance against power holders. Sangari has talked of cross-cutting multiple patriarchies that are part and parcel of wider social formations. In transitional countries, a dominant concept and theoretical frameworks relating to individual and social change is that of women's empowerment, especially in relation to development. It was originally promoted to counter the dissatisfaction felt with the, some of the women and development initiatives. However, the term empowerment remains a highly contested one because while the early United Nations appropriation of empowerment was primarily related to capacity building, it has also been associated with welfare efforts, with grassroots mobilization, with access to resources, with participation in development, and with conscientization. 
Bhatliwala envisions the concept as an individual and collective process whereby the powerless are able to gain access and control over material and knowledge sources and challenge ideologies of subordination. However, when empowerment has been translated into action, it has often stopped at grassroots economic empowerment. Furthermore, empowerment was not conceptualized from the perspectives of grassroots women, often ignoring the domestic and public power dynamics and spaces. In response to some of these criticisms, we and Shahid have proposed a grounded research framework of women to empower themselves in Muslim context, which is inclusive of different levels of macro, micro, and meso power plays, disempowerment, as well as possibilities for empowerment. Gender is another theoretical concept that can be seen as having multiple meanings. Epistemologically speaking, then, it is an analytical category, as well as a thought category. It is also an ideology, a social process, and a social product, as argu argued by Krishnaraj. Earlier in my speech, I looked at gender as subjectivity. But of course, gender has also been extensively theorized as identities, roles and responsibilities, relations, needs and interests, as well as gendered characteristics, behaviors, performances, etc. And in that context, gender can be seen as ontology, as well as a method if you consider gender mainstreaming. On the whole, the example of gender highlights the interdependent relationship between theory and ontology, epistemology, subjectivity, and methods when it comes to feminist research methodology. So let me go to my final category of analysis or aspect of feminist research methodology, feminist politics and ethics. <clears throat> the uh, politics of research refer to the overall motivations, objectives, impact, and outcomes of research. In fact, research by the very nature of its stated objectives has a political interest, as it is aimed towards the production of knowledge, creating individual consciousness and empowerment, and overall improvements in micro, macro structures and practices. Ethics refer to a concern for the ways of conducting research, to ensure that the goals, processes, and outcomes of research are not compromised or impeded, even by default. While it may be optimistic to conceptualize politics and ethics together, they are inseparable and should be understood as permeating all methodologies and aspects of research, especially given the aspirational objectives of feminism. Early feminist politics in the West, or rather early feminist action in the West, were aligned to the political movements of liberalism, Marxism, socialism, and radicalism. At the same time, feminists have been seen, composed, foundational concepts of feminism, such as equity, equality, difference, identity, empowerment, gender, and women, as political issues. On the other hand, feminists have had mixed feelings towards ethics in general, often seeing ethical principles as patriarchally constituted and even religiously aligned, and as yet another way of controlling women and men. Today, ethics increasingly encompass a concern for the researcher's engagements, engagement and negotiation with humans, respondents, research funders, colleagues, etc. Research ethics and politics that initiate social change in individual social structures and practices have become intertwined with issues of representation and the construction of knowledge. Consequently, Birch et al. have talked of amalgamating the empirical and the theoretical when considering ethics. When it comes to fieldwork, feminists have concentrated firstly on the ethics, politics, 
relating to research sources and research methods and those relating to the researcher such as access and informed consent or the power dynamics into interviewing etc a compelling issue that surfaced as a result of that of the intrinsic power of the researcher in the research process this has led to discussions on privilege on truth on location and the possibility or impossibility of full representation of respondents and their realities this includes the probability the ethical problem and the impact of speaking for others as discussed by linda alkoff the power of the researcher or the power that the researcher has over and whether and how to include the perspective of the researched while an insider outsider perspective can engage with some of these issues it raises additional questions of betrayal as a result reflexivity has been employed as a method of problematizing research dilemmas even if it cannot resolve some of the epistemological issues concerned one attempt to resolve the powerlessness of the research participants has been via participatory research though the extent to which this is possible or desirable depends on the participant and the researcher having a mutual agenda as argued by birch and miller another effort at responsible researching that attempts to address the assumed chasm between discourse and action has been through action research kanduja defines action research as i quote focusing on the immediate consequences and applications of problem and not upon the general and universal applications nor upon the development of a theory or model however the possibilities of action research fulfilling the miscellaneous expectations of research participants may not always be realistic there have also been ethical political questions regarding the depoliticization of feminisms due to postmodernist and poststructuralist deconstructions of foundations of master narratives causal theories and their certainty stability and totalism as discussed earlier the concept of difference has been a key issue with gilligan when discussing the significance of accounting for differences in moral reasoning by girls and boys yet assumptions of constructions of bipolarities within differences such as universalism and cultural relativism as discussed by sara ahmed has led to othering and the category of third world women for instance thus the uncritical appropriation of this key conceptualization this construction in modernism difference has raised doubts over the very possibility of postmodern ethics this is because postmodern critiques have deconstructed political objectives and values and standards and processes of legitimization and replaced them with possibilities of differences dissensions and delegitimizations okay i have come to the end of my categorizations or aspects of feminist research methodology so let me finish by some points that i want to ponder over um in this speech i have traced and debated and underscored some of the key strands of feminist research methodology on the one hand they were conceptualized as um as uh, distinct categories of frames of subjectivity ontology epistemology methods theory ethics and politics on the other hand they were also conceptualized as aspects of feminist research methodology that are interrelated and overlapping for instance reflexivity is not only a method of data analysis and writing up it is it may be an output of standpoint epistemology the expression of subjectivity 
and a way of addressing ethical dilemmas in research. Moreover, there have been acute definitions and intense debates pertaining to feminist research methodology from a spectrum of feminist epistemological and theoretical positions. One in particular being that of the Western standpoint as being oppositional to non-Western standpoints. Yet both modernist reasoning as well as postmodernist deconstruction on feminist research methodology has shown us the dangers of such polarizations. Furthermore, the increasing globalization of research, academic discourses, research methodology, and the research imagination as conceptualized by Apadore have led to the questioning of the Western versus non-Western paradigm. Consequently, it is my contention that we need to understand and accept and make use of simultaneously the differences and the assimilations, the divisions and the overlaps, and the concurrences and contestations of feminist research methodology. Thank you.